Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I get the news that we are online and uh, uh, we have a, an audience on our YouTube uh, channel. Uh, my name is Laszlo Kontler. I am a professor of history at CU, and I'm very grateful for the invitation by the CU Democracy Institute and the Review of Democracy uh, to moderate uh, this uh, apparently very interesting uh, discussion, which will be dedicated to one of the recent highlights in the uh, social science humanities history publication world, Professor Timothy Garton Ash's uh, non-autobiography, uh, Biography of Jeanne, he stars it, a um, history illustrated by memoir uh, entitled Homelands. Now, we have a very tight uh, schedule and a great number of commentators. So this is a panel dedicated to the discussion of uh, uh, the book. Uh, it's also called uh, Timothy Garden Ash and his critics uh, discussing contemporary uh, Europe. I'm not sure how fierce uh, those critics are going to be, but at least they are uh, numerous. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, each of the speakers in the order of their appearance. Uh, the five commentators will uh, talk uh, in a uh, row, and then Professor Garten Ash uh, will have uh, an opportunity to uh, reply. So I shall confine the introductions to the bare minimum as the uh, uh, short CVs have been available uh, in the invitation. Our first commentator uh, will be Renata Uitz, who is Professor of Comparative Constitutional Law at the Central European University uh, Department of Legal Studies, and also co-director of the CU Democracy Institute, which hosts uh, this event. So Renata, uh, would you please uh, start your commentary and I shall watch uh, the time and send you a warning when it's out. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Latte, and, and thanks a lot for for the for the excellent um, piece of reading from from Tim. I actually have a, my paws on a physical copy, not just electron, not the, just the electronic. Um, and and it was it was an absolute uh, pleasure to to read another tome of of personal history, and uh, when I was when I was reading the the book, I could really not help but but go back to the file and because much of much of what I thought was was happening in in the file as as a history of the present uh homelands reads very much like a diary for the future uh it's a personal history uh but it's also that the way I read the volume was was opening up Tim's diaries of 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 travels and of of actually working uh the continent and on the continent uh where where he is sharing a a, a lot more than than a personal history it's it's as much about a story of, of a continent, but also the, the story of an idea and, and a story of, of aspirations for, for multiple generations. Uh, Lutzi, Lutzi gave away uh, a very important cue from my CV. I'm a public lawyer by training, so I obviously read this story um, through, through a filter of, of how my generation um, those those people who were born around the time of that fateful Greek cruise uh, that that is in the in the first part of the book in the 1970s got to experience Europe and our Europe, especially from from Hungary, uh, is is a continent where possibilities were slowly opening up, and where I felt uh, where I felt. The, the most uh, intimately involved was, was not so much 88, 89, where things seemed obvious, but, but rather Tim's way of presenting how those event of, of 80, events of 88, 89 have roots in the 70s and, and 80s, very often around diplomatic tables, how most of the changes that seemed radical on TV uh, had had actually a, a lot longer of a preparation. 
And I come from a generation where, where the possibility is opening up, especially accession to, to the European Union, uh, seemed like an almost linear trajectory where we will also get to live our own democracy, uh, a liberal democracy, not an illiberal one, uh, once we become old and and uh finally get to get to sit down and and enjoy uh the achievements of of our fathers and it turns out and this is my perspective uh that this story is 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 much more grim it might not be so surprising if you take tim's long durée and uh, are willing to engage with not just yesterday, but the decade ago, uh, it might seem um, a much more plausible, it might seem like a much more plausible state of being where we are at. Uh, but, but nonetheless, reading, reading Homelands as, as a diary for, for this very present, uh, in, in many ways, it's unsettling and uh, and also reassuring. Reassuring because uh, it seems that if you rely on historians, then then they can give you much better guidance than when you talk to lawyers. Lawyers like linear stories. They like and they very they, they very much like normative arguments. And 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 Tim's Tim's argument. Uh, as normative it is at its heart, because frankly, when you talk about aspirations and ideas and people who made those ideas happen, uh, it, it's hard to, to miss the point that according to the author, Europe is was a good idea. It was a complicated idea, but was a good idea. And uh, uh, but but nonetheless, the, the book gives uh, a lot of a lot of texture. Uh, to to where this idea is coming from, and also the the many points where uh, where those people who who made it happen actually uh, actually faltered and did not necessarily uh, stand stand uh, in 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 the best light of 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 themselves. Now, what I especially appreciate about the the book is how this is a travel not only in time but also across east and west and tim's insistence on on putting the dictatorships back into european history not only to central european history but also to western european history uh, which which i think is which i think is uh a very important contribution of 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 the book to to open up the space for for conversations, especially on on the threshold of illiberal democracy, where you might blame uh, the Orbans and Kaczynskis for the recent illiberal turn, but there is plenty of of intellectual potential in in what is West and and the South of of Europe. Uh, what I also appreciated is is that uh, there is plenty of emphasis not only on the longevity, but also the adaptability of the Salazar and Franco regimes. Mm. Uh, and, and that is the lesson. That is the lesson which I think those who, who would like Europe to, to turn back to, to, to being an inspiration of, of young Democrats should take from the book uh, and read much more carefully than, than they would otherwise do. And then the third lesson, which I which I find equally important, is an active engagement with with the generation of of the post eighty niners, and trying to to make a very active and approachable effort to build a community of memory with this generation. Uh, this is a historian's project uh, that is that is how the how the book is is written but I I feel that at the end of of the day the weight is is on 
on on the shoulders of of all the readers to to build this community and i'm extremely grateful for for tim to 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 draw those connections which might not be evitable uh when we when we sit in east central europe or at the balkans or or southern europe um and i and i hope that he can give us in discussion a few more pointers on on how to start this conversation and how to make it part of of the life that we live i would like to stop here because i'm assuming that uh that there is plenty more from the others thank you thank you very much Renata, for these uh, insights and also for setting an example in terms of uh, uh, economy of time. Uh, now, before we move on to our next speaker, a uh, small remark or piece of information to those of us who follow us on uh, YouTube, who are, I'm sure are very uh, numerous. Uh, if we manage to keep time, there will be uh, some opportunity at the end for a Q&A uh, session. And the mechanism of that is that uh, whoever from the audience wants to make a comment or ask a question, please do that in the chat of the YouTube channel, uh, from which it will be conveyed by our helpers at the Democracy Institute to our own chat. Uh, so please uh, be prepared with that. Now, uh, let's move on to our next uh, commenter, and I'm pleased to invite Celia Donert, who is Associate Professor in Central European History and Director of uh, Research Projects for the History Faculty and Fellow of Wolfson College at the University of Cambridge. Celia, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, and thanks so much for this invitation. It's really wonderful to join the panel. Um, so I'll try and do as well as Renata did in terms of timekeeping. Um, as someone whose own journey through Central Europe has been shaped by reading uh, Timothy Garton-Ash's work from an early age, there was both a sense of familiarity when reading Homelands and much that was new. Um, as we've heard, it's a personal history, not in the sense of being an autobiography, but rather as a history illustrated by memoir. Um, its history is experienced by individual people and exemplified by their stories. Not only European leaders, but also, as um, Tim writes, so-called ordinary people who are often more remarkable human beings than their leaders. It's a book of two halves, of a post-war and a post-wall Europe. Um, at the beginning, um, Tim writes that today's Europe cannot be understood without going back to the period that Tony Jutt encapsulated in the title of his history of Europe since 1945, post-war. But overlapping and in some ways, um, in some important ways, superseding that post-war framing is post-war Europe. And it's here, um, as I'll say a bit later, that I think some of the more um, unfamiliar sections of the, of the book emerged for me um, and much, much that was new. Um, so Homeland suggests that for many Europeans, the post-war era was a 30 years peace, but that it was brought to an end by Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine on the 24th of November of February, sorry, 2022. So these three points, 1945, 1989, and 2022, give the book both its narrative arc and drive its argument. Because as we've already heard, Homelands is much more than a, per a collection of personal reminiscences about Europe. It's an argument. It's an argument about seeing those personal histories as deeply embedded in a particular project of European integration, based on the premise that that project has been shaped by a common thought. And I quote, we have been in a bad place. We want to be in a better one. And that better place is called Europe. So I'd like to start with what I've described as perhaps the more familiar parts of Homelands. The first half of the book is composed of a succession of brief chapters that interweave a narrative about Europe since 1945, with Timothy Garton Ash's distinctive voice as an astute observer of that history, always managing to be in the right place at the right time, illustrating big arguments with well-chosen anecdotes from figures such as Václav Havel, or introducing perfectly drawn pen portraits of characters that he meets on his travels. Woven together, these illustrate um, what he calls the intricate polychromatic local histories of the so-called Kaleido Tapestry of Contemporary Europe, an image which Tim sets in explicit opposition to the two-dimensional black and white Europe of British political debate, debate today. It also illuminates another key argument of the first half of the book, that personal memories, starting with those from the hell that Europeans made for themselves on Earth, are among the strongest drivers of everything that Europe has done and become since 1945. 
So the earliest chapters see Timothy Garton Ash traveling to the village of Weston in northern Germany through to his um, experience as a young man witnessing the fall of the southern European dictatorships in Spain, Portugal and Greece, where we see the emergence of this term that's become that's going to echo down the next 50 years, that of transition. In southern Europe, transition becomes inseparable from membership in the then European community. Um, for southern Europeans, um, Tim writes, the struggle for democracy in Europe was one and the same. His journeys then take him across the border from West to East Germany into Poland and Czechoslovakia in the late 1970s. But we also see him by the 1980s um, in the offices of the Spectator magazine in Britain, where he spent more than 10 years writing about Europe for the most Eurosceptic periodical in Britain. Um, I took note of the fact that he remarks that offshore Britain was and remains a great observatory, not just on account of its semi-detached position, but also thanks to its tradition of sceptical empirical inquiry and robust debate. But he also not acknowledges that even then there were lines that pointed directly towards Brexit. The second half of the book takes on a slightly different tone, perhaps one that's more contemplative and self-reflexive. Um, Tim has already written extensively, as we all know, about the 1990s, for example, in the essays published as History of the Present in 1999. Those earlier works suggested that Central Europe had made successful transitions from communism to capitalism. There were problems, but these seemed to lay, lay further east and south in the former Soviet Union and Yugoslavia. Homeland suggests that the problems may have run deeper and may have even emerged um, within the Euro-Atlantic world itself. Hubris emerges as a central theme of the American New Rome marching into Iraq, the hubris of Tony Blair's Cool Britannia or of Polish supporters of economic shock therapy, of underestimating the challenge for Russia of the enlargement of the American-led geopolitical West into Eastern Europe, of the Eurozone, or e indeed of the whole post-92 European Union project. The hubris of a globalized, financialized capitalism, and this is a direct quote, the hubris of liberals like me, who believed we could now advance from a free Europe towards a free world. So I have three main questions. Um, my first one is this. Does the language or the metaphor of hubris account sufficiently for the problems that have beset the liberal internationalist project since 1989? Or do the causes lie more in the longer history of that project itself? Over the past two decades, there's been a boom in scholarship exploring the history of internationalism in the 20th century, much of which has emphasised the different variants of internationalism, liberal, socialist or even fascist, that have vied for influence in Europe since the First World War. Another major question animating the scholarship, for example, in Mark Mazower's Governing the World, has been the extent to which Anglo-American liberal internationalism has always been entangled with imperialism. So my question is, would there be any, any space in your history of Europe for these interpretations of liberal internationalism? My second question is about the nature of the revolutions in 1989 and the way in which those, the interpretation of these events as products of people power has been thrown into question um, in recent years, not least by populist po politicians who rather see 1989 as a conspiracy between opposition movements and former communist elites to maintain power. Historians of state socialism, particularly in its last decades, have increasingly called attention to both the role of technocratic elites before and after the collapse of communism and the more diffuse experience of everyday life. I wondered, perhaps, if there was potentially a risk that your focus on dissidents might neg neglect alternative ways of understanding the history of state socialism before 1989 and thus also what followed it. I also wondered if these reinterpretations of 1989 might call for a different periodization of Europe's recent history, in which the 1970s rather than 1989 marked the beginning of the history of the present. My third and final question is about the effect of the post-1989 transformation of East Central Europe on the West. You write about the dilemma of cre creating capitalism from communism, but I would just wondered how you would assess the effect of that experiment in Western Europe itself. A number of scholars have suggested, particularly looking at Germany, that neoliberal experiment in the East acted as a laboratory for similar economic and social policy reforms in the West. And that point perhaps takes me to a final um, personal end note. Um, as a British teenager in the early 1990s, 
reading Tim's books on the revolutions of 1989 in Central Europe introduced me to those events and the history of dissident and opposition movements in a part of Europe that seemed to me at that time when our television screens were filled every night with images of the Yugoslav wars, a place that I very much wanted to learn more about. Reading Tim's books made me aware how different our paths as curious Brits in Europe have been. Of course, we're separated by gender and age, but my journey to Central Europe from 19, the mid-1990s onwards was smoothed by a new set of informal and institutional connections, which were less exciting than being tailed by the Stasi, but certainly easier to organise. From student-run voluntary English teaching to jobs of the British Council, the OSCE and the European Commission, followed by a, job, um, a PhD at the European in University Institute. Since Brexit, most of those routes to Europe have been closed to young British people like me. So my final reflection was a very personal one, um, that uh, as we already he heard from Renata, um, Homeland certainly has a, a kind of strong normative element, um, but I very much read it as a, as a kind of defence um, uh, and a call to, to think seriously um, about uh, about Europe and European integration for the future, um, particularly uh, from our point of view on on the on the island of, of Britain um, at the moment. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Celia. And uh, next, I'm turning to Ferenc Lotto, uh, one of our hosts, who is also assistant professor at Maastricht University and uh, editor at the. Uh, Review of Democracy at the CU Democracy Institute. Parents, please. Uh, thank you so much, Lotzi, for your kind words of introduction. And it's a special pleasure to be part uh, of this panel. Timothy Garton Ash's new book, Homeland, uh, builds its narrative around five key themes Europe destroyed, divided, rising, triumphing, and faltering. The most vexing question to emerge out of this sequence should be easy enough to intuit. Why has Europe's rise and triumph been followed by its recent faltering? And that question indeed appears to be a crucial personal matter for the book's author as well. Early on, the narrator recalls the sheer remoteness of continental Europe back in his schoolboy days in the UK. And as the narrative develops, it becomes abundantly clear that the two political causes Carton Ash has been devoted to throughout his adult life are freedom and Europe. In this regard, he has been a rather atypical Brit, I would say, and someone much closer to people in various corners of the continent, especially in countries that have emerged out of dictatorship since the 1970s. As Homelands shows, uh, Garton Ash's personal experience of Europe over the past half a century or so has essentially revolved around how he came to be at home abroad and develop an elective affinity with Central Europe in particular. While too many West Europeans, one might say, were content with the Cold War division of Europe, he personally felt a strong and I should say markedly romantic desire that people less fortunate than him should gain more of the freedom that he enjoyed. Poland would soon emerge as his Spain, and he depicts artfully on these pages, though in surprisingly few words, uh, the country's road to and from its peaceful, self-limiting revolution of 1989. The persona and ideas of Václav Havel, that extraordinary uh, Czech intellectual in politics and close acquaintance of the author, receives about the same attention in the book. Now, in my assessment, uh, the delightful dissection of uh, what Garton Ash calls the bewildering variety of ways that Europeans use the word Europe belongs among the most memorable parts of this book. Uh, he describes with great erudition our fuzzy and contested ideas of geography, the powerful and problematic beliefs in a historical core region, the Europe of culture and values, which he aptly calls a well-dressed but distinctly two-faced character, and the institutional organization of Europe, one might often, and I suppose out of various uh, sentiments, be inclined to call the Euro mess. Uh, 
And not to mention, fifthly, Europe's uh, crude identification with civilization as such, a pattern uh, which the author clearly rejects. And now all these ways of conceiving of Europe uh, by and large uh, fail to relate to what it uh, means most to most of us, as the author emphasizes, and that is the continent of personal experience. And here comes the chief uh, subject uh, of the book, uh, which in the author's case has been closely intertwined with his fine appreciation of a shared vocabulary of symbols, myth, archetypes, quotations, that might be said uh, to amount to a European uh, Gesamtkunstwerk. Uh, what might be slightly absent though, uh, are more critical reflections on how and uh, to what extent providing informed analyses of Central European countries uh, to which Gartonesh has been dedicated for decades, has managed to challenge and perhaps also help overcome that rather narrow uh, Carolingian vision of Europe. If the discovery of this Europe of high culture and also pleasurable ways of life was largely novel and often quite stunning some half a century ago, it is little surprise that it also generated a great sense of curiosity and also possibility for the fortunate youth of those days. And the book is also clearly uh, cognizant of how Europe's integration since has been frequently ironic uh, and the consequence, consequences have often been rather disappointing. Gartonesh does not hide the fact that decades of deepening interconnections notwithstanding the core political conundrum, that is to say the uneasy balance between unity and diversity has by and large been reproduced nor has politics on the European level, which the book I think fittingly calls at once terrifying and extremely boring, or at least it can be that way, nor, nor has this kind of politics been able to capture much popular attention. More specifically, the book's narrative of contemporary Europe revolves uh, around the concept of hubris. This is of course something that Celia has already uh, mentioned. Uh, Gartonesh suggests that the West won the Cold War because it feared that it was losing it. And he rightly considers the contrast with the early 2000s instructive. And this then leads him to highlight a core paradox of liberalism. For liberalism to flourish, there must never only be liberalism. Uh, in other words, in the interpretation of the book, the, the best of days were also the worst of days in the sense the triumph was the direct source of the faltering. Now, Homelands has clearly been uh, panned by a liberal critic of the shape liberalism has taken in recent decades. Uh, the dream of spreading individual liberty was connected much too closely to one model of capitalism, and liberalism came to be viewed damagingly enough as the ideology of the rich and the powerful, uh, Gartonesh emphasizes. But what must also strike the reader is just how defensive uh, his plea for the European project sounds towards the end of the book. Uh, I would say that instead of offering a stirring defense of this cause uh, that would then yield demands for a more integrated continent, he rather reminds his readers in a somewhat anticlimactic manner, uh, I, I should add, that much of the post-war and post-wall European achievement still endures, and that this achievement is nothing less than the largest area of relative freedom, uh, prosperity, and security achieved in European history. Not a little feat, of course. Uh, one might thus say that the story of the book tells is not so much about the unmaking of a grand project, but rather about the disappointed high expectations of a consciously European liberal from the UK. Uh, it is less clear to me how liberal complacency could be overcome and how the European project could be developed further. Uh, the critiques of environmentally heedless capitalism, sexism, uh, of offensive language and behavior that the politically conscious members of younger generations such as, such as mine have articulated in recent years have not really brought a liberal revival closer. And such critiques justified as they are, I think, have also not made political engagement more pro-European, nor are they really likely to do so. Uh, 
Now, the author sounds more forward-looking and assertive than emphasizing how the partnership with the US and all other liberal democracies remains essential in an increasingly post-Western world, and how such a partnership would need to be combined with an embrace of the many people who live in unfree countries, but yearn to breathe freely. In some, I should say the book Homelands, Timothy Gartonesh's uh, history illustrated by memoir is a learned, witty, and judiciously written book. Uh, the result is an account that may perhaps not develop too many groundbreaking interpretations, but it offers a host of sparkling insights and raises vexing, raises vexing questions that should concern us all. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Ferry. And uh, uh, let us now move on to our next speaker, commentator, uh, Joanna Babsiniak, uh, who comes from the University of Warsaw, uh, where she is Associate Professor and Director of the Center for Research on Social Memory at the Faculty of Sociology. Uh, Joanna, please. Thank you so much. I'm both delighted and honored to be here. And as I am the full speaker, I'll be short not to repeat too many aspects of what has been just said, uh, but let me start with <laughs> repeating some of them. <laughs> so no doubt, Homelands are a great comparing read. It's a masterpiece of clarity of writing, as well as connecting an erudite narrative with anecdote and of combining serious intellectual concept with micro stories. Homelands are about a European project and passion about political, political dreams coming true and liberal democratic hopes against all odds. The, books, the book composed of conversation and episodes from all over Europe proposes such a rich epic narrative of almost 80 years that passed between the Second World War and the Russian War of Aggression against Ukraine including various aspects of Cold War, decolonization, transition to democracies, changes in lifestyle, that it is nitpicking, perhaps, to say that the, author, that the author could pack even more into this amazing book. Nonetheless, if only for the sake of today's discussion, I would like to briefly mention three structural processes that are somehow in between the lines of the book, but perhaps would merit a little bit of more discussion, namely the industrialization, digitalization, and new social movements. So, uh, and in relation today to them, I think it is so difficult today to imagine European public sphere in the liberal democratic way many protagonists of this book did. The homelands pay some attention to economic processes, including the neoliberal turn that is so important for understanding the populist backlash all over Europe and so acutely visible in Poland and Hungary. However, the very processes of the industrialization and its consequences resulting in the total reshape of economies, electorates, spaces of experience, and horizons of expectations of European societies would perhaps deserve a bit more attention. The industrialization does not meet the end of industry, of course, but the shifting of thereof from the industrialized economic core of Western Europe to Eastern Europe and to global South and new economic uh, and new compositions of economic and political interest organized around new regimes of work. Second is the digitalization of societies, including media, changes the very functioning of public sphere. If a printed newspaper was a key medium of Habermasian public sphere, the television was the other way of organizing imagined political communities in the second half of the 20th century. Those two main channels of the streaming of political interests and emotions have been largely undermined by the development of new media and the interaction with political projects are, uh, are, more, are more complex. And finally, I think relating to that, what Renata said at the beginning and then Ferenc in what he has said, from the book, we get an acute picture of the rise and the demise of a key political generation of post-war Europe, the 1968ers. One of the answers um, 
sorry. Uh, one of the answers to the future of Europe in the first half of the 21st century lies in the hands of new social movements all around Europe. Will they embrace some of the ideal of liberal democracy? What does European project has offered to them? This is a question we can ask both from the perspective of right-wing organization, but also from the perspective of progressive left-wing movements. You know, I speak from Poland, which has been always very close to heart of, uh, of Timothy Garton Ash. Uh, last year, as you all know, Poland has been particularly witnessing women's and LGBTQ plus communities protest, as well as the protest of human rights activists trying to rescue human lives on the Polish Belarusian border. Their relations to the EU is difficult because they, of course, need to rely on liberal premise, but it often means also disappointment because of impression of neglect, misunderstanding, or being left on their own. I'm not sure. For this generation, the experience of 1968 or the 1980s dissident movement is, to refer to one of key metaphors of homelands, a usable memory engine for their own actions. So my question to Professor Ash is, how do you see the relation of those processes to European projects, the way it has evolved and it will evolve in future? Thank you. Thank you very much, Joanna. And uh, uh, after a legal scholar uh, uh, to historians and the sociologists, we are back to uh, historian Felix Ackermann, uh, professor of public history and academic director of the Institute of History and Biography at Fern Universität in Hagen in Nordrhein Westfalen. Uh, Felix, please, uh, what is yours? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I feel very honored and after spending 10 years in uh, Lithuania and Poland, I'm, I just started in, in the deindustrialized part of Western Germany. And I have to say that the book gave me a lot of uh, food for thought. And first of all, I wanted to start uh, to, uh, with the notion of mobility. I really, I really admire the author's uh, great amount of mobility during Cold War times to be here and there. And also it seemed to me that at some, uh, at many times, you decided yourself um, how many days you could stay in one place, and you were really able to 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 swap between Moscow, Gdansk, and Brussels. Um, of course, uh, looking from now, it it might be more logical, but for me, still, it's it's. Uh, I, I grew up in the in the very east of Berlin, in, in the shadow of the of the wall, very much. So, I found this amount of mobility um, really 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 impressive and and thank you that you made so much out of it second uh second uh observation i i i i, I hoped that you put all your notes on 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 the internet side but then i found out that this, these are the references of course i would encourage you at some point to think about digitalizing your notes because um I found it also very impressive that you kept your diaries uh and of course there is a notion that these were analog diaries and you are you are able to get back to them i'm not sure so if you if i'm not so sure if you had these notes taken in digital form that you would be able to read them today anymore but now uh to my um more general comments like i i am myself concerned with belarus very much and also these days thinking how to how to point to what's going on in this society really disconnected from from many discourses and being in very much in the shadow of the russian aggression against ukraine i found it i found it really brilliant how you were able to by, by not putting the story uh, chronologically but how you were able to contextualize very different phenomena and and uh, in, in this case and how you explain the long-term impact of Solidarność as a peaceful movement and as a revolution which actually took place and, and was very successful in, in overcoming a communist regime and, and also changing very much the state, uh, the, the, the power in Poland and, and, and had an impact much beyond how, how important it was in 2020 for Belarusians as a point of reference, as an experience, even up to the hymn of um, of the Solidarność, which was translated uh, into Belarusian, into Belarusian, and and sang by by Tsikhanovsky, the husband of Svetlana, who is in prison now for for more than two years. So so, what 
what um, if, if we take this to a more general level, I, I found it really um, convincing how you pointed uh, to the uh, crucial interlink between between a more general like, geographical configuration at certain points and the agency of, of, of politicians, but not only of politicians and the more um, the broader social imaginary. So, so I found this really convincing. And the most important point I think for today is that all these processes are open-ended. And that, that's very clear from your book that in, uh, in 1980 and also in 1982 and, and a year later, it was not clear whether it would be po possible to overcome uh, communist rule in Poland and Hungary and uh, in other parts of, of Eastern Europe. And that um, even in 2018, uh, even in 1989, it was um, it was not so it was not so obvious uh, if it would be possible to find, a, 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 for instance, a question to the German a solution to the German question, a, a, a answer how to shape a future Europe in, in a peaceful way and and finding a new configuration and um, like. In particular, uh, having having in mind what's going on in Ukraine and the way uh, the extent how it changes Europe in 2020 and 2022 and 2023, and as, as an ongoing full scale war, then I I um, asked myself uh, the question, and I wanted also to ask you this question: To what extent it makes sense to uphold this notion of the 20th century as a short uh, uh, century of extreme uh, violence? as it was put by Hobsbawm, um, because, I mean, in your book, you, you clearly, it's something like a, a, a self-reflection or maybe a critique that the time after 89 until the early 2000s, uh, 2005, uh, that this was something like a high noon of, of liberal internationalism, but maybe, maybe we see now um, very much the consequences of the shortcomings of this configuration. Like if I think of German, society, then um, I'm not so sure that um, there is a broader conscious uh, of the gift, actually, which was given to Germany, and that the price, actually, Germany itself paid for this peaceful uh, solution, uh, and also to the possibility to create some kind of reunification with all its shortcomings, that this price was not very high. And of course, for me, the most remarkable quote was this meeting by Helmut Kohl and Gorbachev in, in I, I, I think it was in, um, in, in the late 80s when, when, uh, when Kohl made uh, very sure that he, he is a successor to Adolf Hitler. And um, what what actually meant that there is a that there is a consciousness in Germany that uh, the Bundesrepublik actually was the legal uh, successor successor to to the German Reich, and that it had an obli obligation for the way how how politics would be ruled out in Germany. And if I would now today think of um, the way how, how Olaf Scholz is responding slowly and actually not not very much responding to a changed reality, I have the feeling that there is there is something like a a structural problem that we haven't really ch found new ways of um, of conducting politics in Germany. So so if we think of Angela Merkel as a daughter of Kohl very much, then there is nothing new appearing in the meantime, uh, and and that's among the structural problems, I think, much uh, far beyond Germany, and, uh, to what extent we are really able to, to respond to change, which is already underway, which took place already. And yeah, thank you for, for making me think about these issues. And I mean, the question I really wanted to ask is, uh, to what extent we, sh we should um, think about the 20th century as, as a form of continuation uh, of the 20th century and, and these 25 years, not something dis what disconnects us from, from what happened before. So, so the idea would be that we are in a way in, in still in the shadow of 1989 and also of its shortcomings in a way. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> Sorry, thank you very much, Felix, for uh, 
also keeping the time so uh, so conscientiously. Uh, so uh, finally, we turn to our distinguished uh, author, Professor Timothy Garten Ash, uh, Professor of European Studies, unsurprisingly given the title and subject of uh, the book at uh, Oxford, where he's also Isaac Berlin Professorial Fellow of St. Anthony's College, uh, Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. And as you can also see on his screen, he is also director of the Darendorf Program for the Study of Freedom at Oxford. So, uh, Professor Gartenash, uh, the floor is yours to uh, respond and reflect on uh, the criticisms that you have received according to the title of our uh, event today. Well, th thank you very much. Um, um, and thank you all very much. I, I, I have to say I was marginally alarmed when I read the title Timothy Garden Ash and his critics. Um, but I couldn't wish for kinder, more generous uh, and more perceptive critics because you all understood the book extremely well as, as as well as being very kind about it. I'm also very glad to be doing this with the CEU Democracy Institute and Review of Democracy who are doing really important work. And I think all of us on this screen are either by birth or by choice, Central Europeans. Uh, one of the things I say at the beginning of the book is I recall that Franz Kafka wrote a postcard to his fiancée in which he said, basically, I'm Chinese. And although I have absolutely no, um, so to speak, by birth connection to Central Europe, basically, I'm a Central European. So it, it's wonderful to be with you. Um, as you all understood, the, his, the book is history illustrated by memoir and reportage. And to go straight to Felix's question, the Bodleian Library is already twisting my arm to try and get hold of all the notebooks, um, which I will digitize with a few very private pa papers, uh, perhaps <laughs> accepted. Um, as you've all picked up, uh, every anecdote in the book makes a larger historical point. So when I talk about encountering a Czech I only knew as Yizhi, in Prague in 1979, who told me that he'd saved up for seven years to go his first trip to the West, to Paris on his 10th wedding anniversary. He was only going to get $12 a day. So they were going to sleep in the car and eat from canned food. Uh, that illustrates something of what we were asking about, about the roots of 1989, and really brings it home to contemporary Europeans who would find that almost impossible to imagine. When I tell the story of having dinner, speaking Polish with John Paul II in 1987, and suddenly he says, in the course of this conversation, the trouble with capitalism and communism is I dislike the one almost as much as the other. We'd always suspected that of John Paul II and of Wojtyla, but to have it said so plainly, not obscurely, and so on to the Helmut Kohl anecdote, which Felix was actually in 1991. It was after German unification. And this enormous man, I don't know if any of you met Helmut Kohl, but he was the largest man I've ever met. I mean, he was what Dr. Johns called a mountainous man, both in girth and height. And there he is towering over me in his office in Bonn. And suddenly he says, by the way, you do realize you're sitting opposite the direct successor to Adolf Hitler. I think the biggest conversation stopper of my life. What does one say? I am, um, if I'd been quick enough, what I should have said is actually there was Grand Admiral Dönitz in between. Because of course, Grand Admiral Dönitz was actually the successor of Adolf Hitler as Chancellor of the United Germany, but I was too gobsmacked by that. But he himself was making the point about his sense of historical responsibility. Hitler had put a German roof over Europe. He was going to put a European roof over Germany. And one anecdote you didn't mention, which is Vladimir Putin as a totally unknown deputy mayor of St. Petersburg in 1994 at a conference in St. Petersburg, unpleasant looking man, doesn't say anything for two days. And suddenly he pipes up and says, we have to recognize that there are territories that were always Russian, note the word, always Russian, that are now outside the Russian Federation. Uh, and we have a duty to protect them. And he explicitly mentions Crimea, 1994. And there are 25 million Russians who are outside the Russian Federation, and we have a duty to protect them. So each of those anecdotes is in itself, I think, extremely revealing. And as several of you picked up, 
the book is a personal history as much because it's about the personal experience of other Europeans, both so-called ordinary and well-known figures. And as Renata said, it's a story of generations who've made Europe, the 14ers, the 39ers, the 68ers, the 89ers, which if I may, I think Renata, I might class you as, and Celia possibly too. Um, and then what comes afterwards? And that's a question I'll come back to. The normative commitment is very clear. One of you said, I've forgotten who, I'm broadly pro-Europe. Yes, I'm pro-Europe when Europe is enhancing and extending and defending and improving freedom. But the normative commitment can be summarized in the phrase, ich bin ein Berliner, meaning an Isaiah Berliner. So I'm happiest whenever Europe is advancing freedom, which of course was the case in Southern Europe after the 1970s and in East Central Europe, we thought and hoped in the 1980s and 90s. But I'm also very unhappy when it's not advancing freedom. And that also happens. And that's also Europe, right? We mustn't make the prescriptive mistake of assuming that Europe is always on the side of freedom and enlightened values and democracy and human rights. You know, Adolf Hitler was also a European. Viktor Orban is also a European. He's not wrong to say that the values he represents, nationalist, xenophobic, ethnocentric, uh, anti-liberal, are part of the larger corpus of European values, right? They're not the values of the European Union, but they are empirically, historically, uh, European values. Now, this point about freedom brings me to my first response which is to, 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 to Renata's point about your generation's expectation of a linear development of progress. And to those of you who asked about the explanatory power of the term hubris, I would say that what underlies that is what I call a historiosophical mistake. So the fundamental mistake we made, not so much in the 1990s, but in the 2000s, in the early to mid 2000s, that was the point at which we made the end of history mistake. And it was to take, one can do this in English, though not in German, history with a small age, history that is always the product of a combination of structure, process, contingency, conjuncture, choice, collective and individual will and leadership, and turn it into history with a capital H, a Hegelian process of inevitable progress towards the spread of freedom, right? So we took freedom as struggle and quite mistakenly turned it into freedom as process. And we assumed that the way history had gone so impressively, and for a liberal with major setbacks like the war in former Yugoslavia, so positively, basically for a 35 year period, I argue from 1973 to about 2007, eight, and assumed that history would just go on, on that way. So that I think is, is a really important point to tease out, that, that behind the term hubris, there is the explanatory power of the historiosophical mistake. Uh, second comment, um, because Celia asked me to say a bit more about liberal internationalism and imperialism. It's, isn't it fascinating how empire is now such a dominant explanatory concept in so much historical debate? Whereas when I left Oxford, actually when I studied history at Oxford as an undergraduate and when I left, Empire hardly existed. It was something anachronistic and archaic of the past. The future was Europe, the future was integration, the future was modernity, um, but empire was something that we, uh, our, uh, it was about our grandfathers and it was behind us. Which of course, it had only just become. Because one of the points I make very strongly in the book is that the European Union, which likes to imagine itself as this wonderful liberal post-imperial construct 
has itself a colonial past, as is argued in the wonderful book Eurafrica. And West European colonial powers were still fighting brutal colonial wars for 30 years after 1945, up to and including the time when I started traveling in Europe in 1973, right? Portugal only gives up Angola and Mozambique in the mid-1970s. It didn't feature in my consciousness at all at the time, right? We just didn't think about it. And then what happens, this to your point, Celia, is that the EU immediately forgets all that and goes around the world presenting itself as this wonderful liberal post-imperial advocate of human rights, democracy, freedom, dignity, and all these good things in a language which very much recalls a mission civilisatrice, right? Which itself has a liberal imperial um, colouring and connotation and discourse, which of course people in the rest of the world are extremely sensitive to. And by the way, all our talk now about the global South is itself a, a deeply problematic term, right? So there are these serious countries in the North, and then there's this indifferentiated, undifferentiated mass of the global South who have to be won over to the right side, right? It has itself a kind of almost neo-colonial undertone. Some of you will have seen the polling my Oxford research project, Europe in a Changing World, did with ECFR. I don't know how many of you have seen it. You know, the fact that after a year of a brutal war and genocidal war of terror in Ukraine, which is a war of recolonization, not just China, but also India and Turkey are absolutely not on the side of the West in this war. And all say Russia is an ally or necessary partner tells you something very significant. And one of the things it tells you that they remember 600 years of European colonialism and 200 years of Western hegemony. And now it's payback time, right? So I think it's, it's very important in that larger story of where we are. And one of the reasons to, to connect to Felix's question, why I do still believe in the explanatory power of the short 20th century is that the post-war period is also the period in which, to give it in crudest shorthand, we move into a post-Western world, right? A one in which non-Western great powers are calling the shots and setting the agenda word part, not to mention global warming, global overheating, so that there are large structural forces, it seemed to me, that characterize the post-wall period, as well as its illusions of proceeding to eternal peace. Third comment, um, that complex of comments that you all had about 1989 causes and consequences neoliberalism. Very quickly, what I think is clearly deeply inadequate is the explanation offered by Stephen Kotkin in his book about 1989 in Eastern Europe, that it was simply collapse, that the end of the GDR explored as bankruptcy. That, that is a profoundly inadequate uh, uh, explanation, which succumbs to the illusions of retrospective determinism. Of course, I'm not going to claim, and I don't claim in the book, that it was all about the dissidents and all about the social moments and all about Solidarność and Václav Havel. That would be absurd. What I think is true is that you have four quite distinct developments in um, the Soviet Union with Gorbachev, starting 1985, in Western Europe with Jacques Delors, in Eastern and Central Europe with the dissidents developing the new evolutionism, a strategy for political change, and in the United States with Ronald Reagan. And it seems to me that it's only the convergence of those four in 1989, in what I call a one in a million example of historical luck, Machiavelli's Fortuna, that gives us that change. So I don't think any single 
we talked about structure and agency, structural explanation is sufficient. Now, my problem with the Philippe Tain, to name a specific author, the Philippe Tain interpretation of how the neoliberalism, which sort of revved up in Thatcher's Britain and Reagan's United States, then advanced into Central and Eastern Europe, which became a sort of laboratory for a crude neoliberal experiment, um, is the following. That sort of suggests that the people who were leading the transition in post-communist Europe were in some conscious sense neoliberals in the way that people in the 19, late 1940s in Central Europe were consciously communists and the people in the 1930s were consciously fascists. Not true. Absolutely not true. I can tell you from a lot of first-hand experience, with a few exceptions. Václav Klaus, clearly. Tomasz Ježek, clearly. But they're the exceptions who prove the rule. Even Leszek Balsarowicz is very hard to categorize in any strict sense as a neoliberal. But Tadeusz Mazowiecki, Bronisław Geremek, Václav Havel, Apad Gönz, most of the politicians of that time were not in any meaningful sense neoliberals, right? For most of them, Sweden would have been the perfect, some sort of West European social democratic model. I had these conversations with them at the time. They just had no idea how you turned the fish soup back into an aquarium, a, a command economy back into a market economy. And as, as they said to me, we're not economists. We don't know about capitalism. So what the case is, this is simply what they were told from the West is how you do capitalism, the Washington consensus and so on. And even then, when you look at the reality of economic and social policy in, in post-communist Europe, it was anything but pure, anything but pure neoliberalism. It really wasn't. I'm sure you'll all agree. If you look at social policy, the role of the state. What I think is true is that there was a particular version of capitalism, which I call globalized, financialized capitalism. Globalization and financialization being two key ingredients which became predominant, which post-communist Europe got in a particularly crude form, and which had a particular etiology in East Central Europe because it was connected to cultural issues, claims about historical injustice, who was getting rich, the former nomenclatura, the former social police, unlike in Western Europe. So it had a particular etiology. It produced unprecedented levels of inequality, and it led us into the 2008 global financial crisis, which segued into the Great Recession and the Eurozone crisis, in which, by the way, if you look at Viktor Orban's rhetoric, plays a significant part in his embrace of the illiberal route to modernity. He, he remember, says, you know, the 2008 crisis showed us that liberal democratic capitalism is not the only way to modernity. So that would be my take on that. I think there's a, there's a trap, even if we want to use neoliberalism as shorthand, Celia, that there is, there's a trap contained in that interpretation. And, and the reality is more complex. I love Renata's point, which hadn't occurred to me, about how adaptive the Franco and Salazar regimes were. I, I think that's a really interesting point, which I shall use with acknowledgement. Um, and I think if we then look at the way Viktor Orban has demolished democracy and how Yaroslav Kaczynski is trying to follow suit, and let's have no doubt, Hungary is no longer a democracy. It's a competitive authoritarian regime. Um, there, there are some interesting comparisons to be made. The difference, of course, uh, is that Salazar's Portugal and Franco Spain and the Colonel's Greece were not members of the EU and the post Maastricht EU, right? So that, that that's a part of the story. And on the contrary, the, the transition to liberal democracy 
went hand in hand with the transition to European membership, European community membership, right? So for me, the real shock of the post 2008, particularly post 2010 period, is the fact that it was possible for Viktor Orban systematically to demolish a liberal democracy inside a European Union, whose clear not just normative but legal commitments in the Treaty on European Union were to preserving liberal democracy and to do it actually with the aid of EU funds and EU membership. So that's a, a really important, I think, part of the story. Just briefly to Joanna on media, I'm going to slightly disagree with you there. Uh, yeah, of course, new media are really important. Um, but my goodness, television still matters, right? I mean, in 1989, I tell the story of the roundtable negotiations in Poland when um, Jacek Kuron started saying, we have to talk about who controls television. And I think it was General Kiszczak, if memory serves, who said, we'd rather give you the riot police than give you television, because it was the key to power, right? But what strikes me is just how important television continues to be even in this connected world um, of, of new media. Um, I think I, some of you know the argument of Jochai Benkler in his work on the media system in the United States. And he argues that Fox News is more important than Facebook. But more specifically, that it's a combination of these various different kinds of media. It's talk radio and Fox News and Facebook, which create a poisoned information environment in which people uh, have alternative facts. And that, of course, is what Viktor Orban, to a significant degree, has achieved. What fortunately has been so far largely prevented in Poland, but I would say, Joanna, thanks above all to TVN. I mean, what the Polish political in information environment would look like if you didn't have TVN? seems to me a very serious question. Um, so that, and, and, and without TVN, I don't think you could have a free and fair election in Poland. So I think, you know, the test of that proposition that online media and other media can beat the power of TVP, you know, is coming down the tracks. Two final points before ho throwing it open for, I hope, a few questions and comments from the floor. The first one is a very important made, point many of you made, which is we have to go back to the 1970s to understand 1989 and what followed. And the point I want to tease out here is that the 1970s was a period of acute intellectual pessimism, right? It was a period when people seriously believed that the Soviet Union was actually not just catching up with, but could even overtake the United States. Look at the first edition of John Roberts' History of the World. I quote it in the book, saying that it's for industrial and technological capacity, the Soviet Union can match or even outdo the Soviet Union. Where the United States was on the rocks because of Vietnam, Watergate, New York going bankrupt, where we were talking about eurosclerosis in continental Europe, and in Britain, we had the sick man of Europe and the winter of discontent. And as several of you pointed out, it is precisely because we had that clarifying intellectual pessimism that we identified how deep the problems were and therefore got to address them in the 1980s, right? So that the, and in the 2000s, it's the opposite, right? We have a unfounded intellectual optimism, the linear fallacy that Renata was talking about, history with a small h interpreted as history with a big h, the neo-Hegelian mistake, and look what happens then. So that what I argue at the end of the book is that we need the famous combination, always attributed to Gramsci, although actually it comes from Romain Rolland, uh, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. 
And I think if we're in a period of intellectual pessimism, that is potentially a very good sign. That's a good thing, because that's what gave us the upper turn of the 1980s and 1990s, right? Um, as long as we also have the optimism of the will. And this goes to my very final point, which several of you picked up, community of memories, post 1989 as parents, are we being too defensive or am I being too defensive, Joanna? social movements, uh, where do they take us? So some of you will know that my Darndorf program here had a project a couple of years ago called Europe Stories, which was specifically exploring through a combination of quantitative methods, opinion polling, and in-depth interviews, the attitudes to Europe of young Europeans, what we call the post-1989ers. And what we found in 2020, 2021, was that while the 89ers, the 68ers, the 39ers, the 14ers had a formative moment, a key historical moment that defined them, this generation didn't seem to have a formative moment. What they had was a formative shared experience, which was freedom of movement. Felix, you mentioned it. That was top of the list, freedom of movement of course, by the way, bought at the cost of less freedom of movement for people outside Europe, and a shared commitment, which was combating climate change, right? Now, here comes the question, and it's a question that was put to me by a student in Göttingen the other day when I gave a talk about this book. And she said, you've talked about the 14 is 39 and 68 is 89 is. Do you think there'll be a generation of 22ers? That is to say, do you think that the Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, the largest war in Europe since 1945, something we never thought would happen again, is actually going to shape a new generation of Europeans and their commitments to you know, defending but also enhancing um, a, a Europe whole and free. And I think that's a, a, a really interesting question to end on. One would have to have a question mark because, of course, unlike in 1945 or 68, or to a lesser extent in 89, it hasn't actually been a shared experience of most young Europeans, right? Um, it's been an experience in, in Ukraine and to a significant degree in neighboring countries. But nonetheless, I thought it was interesting that a, a student in the west of Germany in Göttingen asked this question about the 20 tours, because we're certainly going to need their commitment and their new ideas, um, both for you know, defending and extending and improving um, the European Union and for driving forward the great project which I hope will characterize the next 10 to 15 years of the second big eastward enlargement of, 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 of the European Union. So, so I end with praise of intellectual pessimism, which I hope will be music to Hungarian ears, since Hungary is, of course, the world capital of intellectual pessimism, and some very cautious hope of some optimism of the will from the 22ers. Hey, thank you very much for this concise and complex and uh, and very mixed uh, response. Um, uh, and let me now turn to questions from the audience, which start appearing in our chat. Uh, the first one uh, reads as follows. Many years ago, I phoned somebody in England, but I was told that I cannot speak to him as he is in Europe. I had always believed Britain to belong to Europe, even despite Brexit. Uh, what do you think? And I think that uh, in the book, there are a couple of passages which already include an inherent response to this, but this is a complex question itself. So please, uh, what are your reflections? Thank, thank you very much for that question. I'm, of course, speaking to you from Oxford, Europe. It's absolutely clear. There's no question at all. In, in every single atlas 
since Eratosthenes 2,200 years ago, Britain is part of Europe. The history of Europe is unthinkable without Shakespeare and Churchill, the role of England and then Britain through European history. Of course we're in Europe. Um, Britain can no more leave Europe than Piccadilly Circus can leave London. And actually, even the Eurosceptics uh, ag acknowledge that. So that, to me, is absolutely clear. Um, um, unfortunately, um, many Brits are starting to forget it again. So I don't know if Celia, who's sitting in Cambridge, would agree, but I'm really concerned about the way more and more people in this country are slipping back, even, even pro-Europeans, even Remainers, into that old lazy habit of talking about Europe as somewhere else. We can't do that because of Europe. Um, so I think there is a cultural perception consciousness problem. Um, and, and Britain is starting, let me give you a quick example. Um, there was a European Council, I was in Brussels um, uh, at the end of last week, and there was a European Council. So every member state of the EU was knew there was a European Council and there were certain issues to be debated. You wouldn't have known about it reading or watching most of the European media. And so, unfortunately, we are drifting apart from the sort of rhythms and historical experience of continental Europe, which is very regrettable indeed. But um, much as the Eurosceptics would like it, we're not anchored off the coast of New York. Thank you very much. Now, uh, question number two, which seems to be rather a comment. In the past, Europe represented to the rest of the world both, both colonialism and the inspiration of modern citizenship and constitutionalism. Today, it stands for both a vibrant civil society and complicity in theft, tax havens, offshore accounts, the whole neoliberal financial and legal apparatus. So I believe, uh, as this is not a question, but a comment. Can I, uh, can I respond to that quickly, if I may? Yes, 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 please. Yes, yeah, I mean, first of all, <laughs> whoever this is asking the question, we don't have names or, or locations, I would suggest a short trip to Kiev. Um, because if you want to believe in Europe again, and if you want to believe in the European Union, just go to Kiev, as I did last month. Um, and once again, you have that passionate belief in Europe as a set of ideals connected to a concrete political project, which we all remember, or at least many of us remember, from Southeastern Europe in the 2000s and late 1990s, from East Central Europe in the 1980s, and from Southern Europe in the 1970s. So, um, you know, I think the, the soft power of Europe, its power to attract, in Joe Nye's definition, is still very much there. However, where I very much agree, and this goes to globalized, financialized capitalism, is that money, moneyed interests, um, finance, and international capitalism has much too much power and privilege in our politics. And I think that's a real structural problem of our politics. Um, uh, just to give a small example from Britain, um, you can buy a seat in the British Parliament. There is a man called Peter Crudus, Lord Crudus, who's effectively bought a seat in the British upper house of the British Parliament uh, as a major donor to the Conservative Party, although the House of Lords uh, Appointments Committee had advised against his uh, appointment. And there are, you, the, the influence of donors on politics all over Europe is far too large, the influence of industry. So I, I, I think there is a, a, a real problem and the intertwining of financial and political elites in many liberal democracies um, has led to, led to that kind of comment. Uh, and so I think you know, that is one of the challenges of making our European liberal democracies such as they are more attractive and, and cleaner again. Thank you very much. Uh, well, there are no more questions for the time being in the YouTube chat. So uh, let me, we still have about 10 minutes. So let me turn back to our 
commenters to ask if they have any rejoinders to uh, 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 Professor Garth and Ash's responses. Celia, you have been specifically asked a question about uh, how, how do you view things from Cambridge? <laughs> about Britain, where, where is Britain? <laughs> yeah, good question. Um, <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, I did have a, I did have a question. Um, I suppose following up on that, um, you know, I, I get very depressed, obviously, about the the state of of, of affairs uh, in Britain and and atti attitudes towards towards the EU. We have a very strange sort of uh, public uh, discourse about about Europe. We have a lot of uh, newspapers, which obviously, as everyone knows, are, are heavily heavily eurosceptic. So, um, I mean. One question I suppose I had um, was, you know, this, as as we all said, was was both a history of Europe and a kind of argument about European integration. Um, I mean, one thing that strikes me about, you know, sort of um, uh, academic scholarship on the on the EU itself and the history of uh, European integration is that, you know, the nature of that scholarship um, perhaps doesn't always lend itself uh, to making the European project easily accessible to non-experts. Um, you know, it, it does sort of tend to, you know, perhaps you know, map the sort of technocratic nature of the EU itself in the way it writes. I just wondered if you had any thoughts about um, about that. Is is there any way that you know um, scholars, for example, in Britain, could be could be doing more, um, you know, to 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 sort of combat these these quite kind of dangerous, I would say. Um, myths, uh, you know, that sort of the the, the idea that the um, the kind of Eurosceptics kind of get the upper hand in in public debates about Europe because um, pro Europeanists aren't able to kind of control the control the story, I guess. Yeah, well, th thanks very much, Celia. Two quick comments on that. First of all, you mentioned the Eurosceptic press. Um, <laughs> without the Eurosceptic press and its dominance, because most British newspaper readers read a Eurosceptic. Uh, paper, we would I doubt it not have had Brexit. And this goes to a very interesting little point where the normative clashes with the, so to speak, uh, empirical and political, because uh, much of that Eurosceptic press had foreign owners. And so from the British experience, you might be tempted to the normative proposition um, that we have to be very careful about foreign owners. Rupert Murdoch, Conrad Black, and so on. If I look at East Central Europe today, thank God we have foreign owners. Actually, the independent media survive, crucially, because of foreign ownership. So it perhaps shows the slight difficulty of taking up what seems an apparently simple normative position on an issue like that, because the same phenomenon has a negative effect in Britain, but a positive effect in a country like Poland. Um, with all due respect to all the wonderful colleagues writing about the EU, it isn't the most readable literature in the world. That's absolutely true, partly because the nature of the beast is extraordinarily complex and technocratic, because actually that was the idea, to make it boring, to make it technocratic, uh, right? Um, so that actually it would be one hell of a challenge to make how the EU works really exciting reading, which is why one has to go broader as someone writing about Europe. And you have to write about the real Europe, the Europe of lived experience, as, as you've all said, and connect it to the EU as a thing that enables that. So that one of the things that I say in the book and that explains the title is that the unique feature of being a European is that you can be at home abroad, right? I'm in Budapest, I'm in Paris, I'm in Berlin. I'm clearly abroad, but I'm also at home. Hence the title, Homelands. Poor old Americans can only have one homeland, as in homeland security. Uh, Chinese have one homeland, but we as Europeans can have multiple homelands. And that seems to me the unique and wonderful thing about the European experience. And if one can then connect it as one must to the very boring and complicated political arrangements 
which enable that experience, um, then I think um, you might only not only have a few read, more readers, but actually have a few, few more people who see the point of your Thank you. And uh, Renata is telling me in a direct message that she's happy to follow up and we still do have a couple of minutes. Great. Renata, please. So this is, and, and, and this is in part because Tim, Tim says that, you know, Orban is still in, in the EU. And I guess uh, that tells as much uh, about the skills of Hungarian politics as about the EU and the, the degree to which the European project is about as the European project, as the project of the EU is about freedom. Uh, so with, 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 this, with this opening gambit, I am of course uh, more, more than convinced that, that uh, Europe is, is an experience and, and you juxtapose the formative moment to a formative experience. Now, part of, of the problem is that the, the European experience based on freedom of movement permits everyone to curate their very own Europe. And uh, that can be actually not simply personal, but, but also devoid of, of any sense of, of community. So if, if we take your latest response really, really seriously, the EU being terribly technocratic to, to the point of, of, of alienating, and, and even the, the most positive of 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 the optimism of the will in the climate movement uh, being the uniting force. Uh, ultimately, I'd really like to to ask you about where where is this sense of empathy, this sense of community, uh, of togetherness uh, in in Europe going to to come from? This enchantment with political parties, very strong anti-establishmentarism, and and the demonization of civil society, just being, and and of course the demonization of unions, thus being uh, a, a few of the forces that go against creating this sense of a Europe as a shared experience, and and so if 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 a good pessimist Hungarian could ask for some optimism. <laughs> on 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 the shared experience bit, then I'd like to use the the last comment to to poke you a little bit in 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 this direction. So I'd love to respond to that great um, comment question. As we all know, after Italian unification, we have made Italy. Now we must make Italians. I think with Italy, with with Europe, it's the other way around. I think we've made Europeans. Now we need to make Europe. Because actually, because the experience of travel uh, through the Europe is so extensive, I mean, way beyond the famous Erasmus generation. One of the points I make in the book, again, taking us back to the 1970s, is that mass travel in Europe starts in the late 60s, early 70s. So no earlier generation, most Europeans before then um, had hardly travelled outside their own country, except in a war, uh, or because of um, uh, they couldn't make enough to eat on the farm, so they emigrated. Right, most Europeans, uh, middle class in the nineteenth century. But now you suddenly have mass travel. So actually, there is, you know, there are very few uh, Europeans I would submit who don't have some experience of some other European countries, and. Um, and actually, I think do have fellow feeling with other Europeans, even Eurosceptics. And I think one can, you know, produce some good evidence for that. The, the 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 problem is that those positive associations with, you know, the friends in in Lisbon or or the holiday in Provence or whatever it may be, the cafe in in Krakow, doesn't connect to the political community except in a much smaller group. So I come back to that point about the connection, Renata. But nonetheless, I think we, we have Europeans. It's just the Europe we have to make. Can I finish? Because I know we're coming up to time. Um, because since we're talking as Central Europeans with Central European University, I mean, the story of what Orban did 
is truly one of the most depressing stories in this book. I was put on to Viktor Orban as a bright hope of the democratic opposition by my great friend Janos Kish. Met him first in Budapest in 1988. 1989, he was our student in Oxford. I can still see him just a few meters away from here, standing bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, telling me how he was going to build a wonderful liberal democracy in Hungary. We identified him as one of the most skilled politicians of his generation. We were not wrong. The trouble is he used his skills to demolish democracy, not to build it. And I do find the failure of European normative power and indeed legal power to be one of the most profoundly depressing stories. I'm sorry, this is going to Hungarian pessimism again, Renata, but one of the most depressing stories of, of, of the last decade. And I was just beginning to get a, 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 a bit more optimistic about it with the efforts of Franz Timmermans and Vera Jourova, who I saw in Brussels on Friday, by the way, with a huge portrait photo of Václav Havel on her wall in 2020, 2021. And then, alas, the war in Ukraine, which should make it more important than ever that we defend freedom in our own countries, come along. And because of the way the dysfunctionality of the political system of the European Union, this actually enables Orban again. So that now he has more possibilities of blocking, vetoing, as does Poland, by the way, also, um, uh, playing the European system, getting more European funds out of it, threatening to block and then winning another concession. And, and I'm afraid changing the actual functioning of the political system of the European Union, so that is no longer possible is going to be a very difficult task. But I mean, it's for me, one of the most important tasks uh, for, for, for the next few years. And by the way, the Polish election, autumn this year, one of the most important elections, perhaps the most sing important single election in Europe, alongside that in Turkey. So um, there's a, there's a good deal to watch out for in, in Central Europe. But thank you all very much once again. It's been a wonderful set of commentaries and very stimulating for me. Thank you very much indeed uh, to all six of you. Well, uh, it's <laughs> how to end this conversation after the uh, the final thoughts of, uh, uh, of our distinguished author um, in any other way than uh, uh, under the spell of Hungarian uh, pessimism, maybe maybe the twenty two words. Uh, let's let's think of the of the twenty two words. I think it's a it's a nice uh, idea, a nice uh, initiative to uh, put it put this on on the table. Uh, for now, uh, I think uh, we need to bring this to an end. Uh, our time is out. Uh, thanks again to uh, uh, to the five critics who have uh, 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 provided a rich menu for. Professor Gartanesh to reflect on, and thanks also for the uh, uh, for the replies, which uh, uh, surely will inspire many of our audience to uh, to read the book uh, in all the detail and uh, with all the attention it deserves. Uh, thanks also for the colleagues at the Democracy Institute for uh, for having uh, put this act uh, together, and. Uh, uh, to Timothy Gartenash, thanks a lot again for the for the insights, and uh, we hope to see you back at Central European University before long. Pleasure.